Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good good whatever it is the time that you're watching this. Good all those things. <laughs> Welcome back to our Curl Conversations. Of course, I am Faith and we have Janessa here as per usual. We're excited to be here today. We thought we would kind of um, talk with our community a little bit more directly today. Um, we collected some questions from our stylist community um, and so we thought we'd answer them live here. And so one, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat here. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask Janessa, and maybe I'll weigh in too, um, the first question that y'all submitted and we'll go from there. Sound good, Janessa? Yeah, I love this one. I think that these are a lot of the questions that even being on the field, like traveling all around North America and meeting stylists, these are really common questions that I think that happen and kind of we get a lot. And so I think this is gonna be really valuable. And hopefully we Perfect. can get light, yeah. Yeah, I hope so too. So we'll go ahead with the first question. The first question is I'm only one person and I feel like I'm doing it all. My business doesn't generate enough income for support staff. What should I do? Yeah, um, that is, I mean, that's the ultimate question, right? Is like, how do I, it's really about how do we make profit? Because it's really easy, especially when you're an individual, I think that, you're overrun, like you're doing everything, you know, you're doing absolutely everything. And so how do we find support staff that we can delegate to? I think the best and kind of most economical way of doing that is like, if you already have like, if you already have an accountant, then ask your accountant how else they can help you to maybe take over some bookkeeping or some of the, the extra kind of side support stuff that isn't necessarily done in the salon. That's really important. Um, also, you can kind of relieve some stress on your plate by including technology, you know, and, and maybe online booking can help do that so that you're relieving some stress for yourself that way as well. If it's harder to bring in support staff for that, there's a lot of technology that can make that really easy, um, especially online booking. And even like in some online booking systems, you can actually have your clients prepay for their service, which helps with a lot of reception duties as well. And so there's a lot of really great available technology. A lot of it's not very expensive at all. Um, then the other thing, the one that I'm really passionate about is making sure that all of your time is charged um, accordingly, you know, and merely making sure that your pricing systems aren't just set up to um, bring in money, but to pay for your expenses, right? To start from how much money do I need to make in order to pay for my expenses? And then when you're when you're figuring that out, like add yourself in an expense for a support staff, like add yourself in an expense for an assistant and then have yourself a goal to work towards. So you can start to raise your prices so that you can start to include that in an expense and set yourself up so that you give yourself some time to be able to bring that help in because it's a lot. There is a lot that we do, a lot that we do. Totally. I actually have, we have a follow-up question to this. Um, and I think, you know, it's very interesting, the different philosophies and different, I guess, culture, salon cultures that there's, we have apprentices, we have assistants, we have shampoo people in different parts of the country. And I think of, with different business models. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this, this question shares about, you know, I don't, I don't gen generate enough income for support staff. Um, then we have this other question that is asking, when should you take on an assistant and how do you make sure it's beneficial to their growth? I imagine that might be a question too in regard to, well, am I making enough money or do I have enough clientele in the salon to have an assistant? Mm -hmm. um, so this is a many questions. So I, I wanna un also unpack the difference between an assistant, an apprentice, and someone who does shampoos Right. And then why would one need one of those three or all of them? Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, the like to have somebody who just does like shampoos and does that can really speed up your work, um, I think. And then they, they end up growing. Like for me, actually, the conversation really is like how they start together. Right. Like somebody who does the shampoos turns into an apprentice turns into a support staff, turns into, right? So there is always an opportunity for growth throughout that experience. But to have somebody start as your styler or your shampoo, you know, at the shampoo bowl can really help to speed up your services. So it's about getting them in, 
getting them trained as fast as possible, and then taking that time and being able to book it with another client, right? So it's really about setting them up with enough information and to put you in a position where you're confident enough to make sure that they can take on that role on their own. So it's dedicating a little bit of time in the beginning, for sure. But the second they're ready to fly with that one skill set, let them do it and clear it off your book and then slowly grow another skill set. So maybe it's, um, you know, maybe it's the the finish to me, it was like always the shakeout. Like that was another skill set was like the finish. And then also the photography, like how to take the photos. Like those are all individual little skill sets. So every time you teach, you know, an apprentice or somebody who's growing with you, one little skill set, immediately remove it off of your own calendar and assign it to that one person. I think that's, it's really about delegating, you know, and all those different roles are different levels of responsibility um, because it will be different levels of experience that they have. And so the more you kind of offload from you onto them, one, it gives them the ability to learn that skill set for when they are growing their own book. So it's really important to, to give them those kinds of responsibilities, but it also relieves you, it opens you up to like, I mean, maybe book another client, but also take a break, you know? And it's definitely time to get an assistant or some kind of support staff if you are booked out weeks in advance. It's definitely time because that's just no break for you if you you need to take some time for yourself and set some healthy mental health boundaries in that way too. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. Um, another follow up to this question. So I speak to a lot of new stylists or maybe people who are just out of cosmetology school. I know some re regions don't require a licensure or school mm -hmm. for a license, but. Anyway, new stylist, new to the game, new to taking clients, maybe new to being in the salon. And what is it that is, why would I want to pursue an apprenticeship or an assistantship as a new stylist? Um, and also what is the difference between being an assistant and being an apprentice? Is there a difference? I don't think there's a difference. I mean, in my world, I don't think there's a difference. I think that if you're taking on an assistant, it's not just somebody who's going to get you coffee. You know what I mean? And like making your lunch order. It's it's a responsibility to grow that individual in their own career and their own skill set. You know, and the benefit is that once you are able to train them for those specific skill sets that they're um, they're there to assist you with, right, within their apprenticeship. So once you give them those skill sets, then, of course, it, it relieves it off of you. You're building their book. You're growing their business. You're able to take on more at the same time. And so you're able to be a little bit busier and you're kind of growing your own little salon team. Even as in salon suites, this happens in suites, right? It's like you're able to grow a little mini team but you're giving somebody the ability to learn and build their own education. So it's really important. Like I think the distinction between assistant and apprentice is like an assistant answers your phones, right? And like helps ring out people, grabs you a coffee order, like gets like that's an assistant, someone who's like booking your appointments and, and doing things that aren't service specific related. But apprentice really is service specific related and you're growing somebody's career and you're helping to build that, which is, really valuable, not just for your own business, but for their business, right? And I think that's that's really important is to share the information. Yeah, totally. What's the what's the best way to make sure that um, an assistantship is beneficial to the assistance growth? Um, I know this person was asking this question here, but I know that in salons I personally worked in, there were of course times a year where it was so busy that you know, maybe I was just, we were just in the motion of things and I wasn't necessarily using it, using or learning anything new. Um, but how do you kind of like, how do you make sure that you have that give and take, that relation, that apprentice, um, is more senior stylist relationship intact or beneficial, mutually beneficial? Mm -hmm. I think it's involving them in the experience as much as possible. It's evolving your assistant in the experience as much as possible. When all of my assistants, um, and I've, I've grown all of my team uh, from an assistant role. So they started with me and then moved on um, completely. And I've done that because I wanted to be able to provide education. And that's what it really, what it comes down to is a mindset of the apprenticeur or the stylist is, how can I, how can I pass on this information? How can I share this? You know, and it's like, it's, actually kind of fun even for our clients when our clients are in our chair they love when I talk through a haircut or if we're discussing something like I'm taking every moment I possibly can to explain what I'm doing 
all of the time and to give as much of the why around everything. And then it's kind of a cool moment when you see it click and then you see them develop the confidence to be able to do it on their own. And once that happens and then it's like, it's go, it's like so much fun to see and to watch people fly and develop. So that, that is really how you make sure it's beneficial to their growth is that you are not just, I don't want to say barking orders, but that's the culture that I grew up in where you're just like, go do this. Like it's, here's the color formula, go mix it. It's really taking the time to say, this is the reason why we're mixing this color formula. And you know, it's, you can do that together and still have them work efficiently with you. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much. So moving on, um, we have the next question that came in from our stylist community is, how should I price my services? I want to stay competitive in my area. Yeah, I want to stay competitive in my area. That is like, oh, that's a big, that's, that's the kicker at the end of the sentence, right? It's like, it's sometimes okay to not be competitive in your area also. You know what I mean? Like it's it's also okay to price yourselves for your the own the value that you create within your customer experience, um, and it's really important. I think a lot of salons or a lot of stylists get into this loop of, um, well, at least when I was starting out, I was told to call around to different salons in my area and find out what they price and then price my haircut somewhere around there, right? But the problem is, is that they don't all have your bills <laughs> at the same time, right? They don't have the same expenses as you. And so if they're not making any money and you're pricing your prices based off them, then you might not be making any money. And so it's kind of a flawed system to stay competitive in that mindset. But I think that really it's about not just thinking about how you price yourself competitively, but how you offer value to that experience, regardless of your area. You know what I mean? Like, regardless of that, how how are you connecting with your clients? How are you creating a welcoming environment? How are you making your clients feel seen? How are you setting yourselves apart from that? It's really about having a competitive experience, even though I don't really like the word competitive, but really putting the value in the experience so that you're priced appropriately for what you feel is right for you. And that's what it comes down to, I think. Not necessarily competitive to your area. Do you think? Yeah, no, that makes that makes total sense. Um, I think also Silas struggle to have the confidence that they can have a price that is out of the range of their neighbors. Um, for example, especially in the curl stylist community, there are many stylists who have a lot more continuing education than maybe their neighbors. And, you know, I think it's okay to consider these things. Plus, I like what you said about competitive. I think there's like a difference between healthy competition and then comparing yourself to others. And I think being a hairstylist really brings out that I'm comparing myself to other people in my field. Um, but, you know, if you have confidence in what it is that you're doing, and also if you have clients that will pay you, like just like you shared, if you have clients who will pay you for a certain customer experience, um, and their relationship with you and and to be sure that you're going to be giving them the top-notch service not only just technically but you they'll learn from you etc cetera, etc cetera. um i think it's about really not comparing yourself to others and having that confidence that what you have to offer is special yeah this is like tangent time as usual at least one per episode but um <laughs> right but like I, I honestly, side note, like I really do think that this conversation causes a lot of emotional response when it comes to stylists. Like anything that talks about pricing causes this really big emotional response. And I think because historically our industry has said things like charge your worth, right? But it's really important to know that your worth has absolutely nothing to do with your service prices. Your worth is your own personal worth. And those words can be really kind of tricky, right? Like it can almost make you feel like, oh, if somebody says I'm too expensive, then they're saying that I'm not worth it personally, which is really important to remove yourself, remove those emotions from that. You're offering a service and you're offering a very valuable service. And really think about not necessarily like eliminate the concept of worth and think about the value that you can place within that client for someone else, right? Because our prices are a reflection of our worth they're a reflection of the value that we offer someone else. 
um, and offer that that person who's deciding to share that experience with us. Because that's really what it comes down to. We're not doing something on someone, right? We're experiencing something with someone. And so that's the that's where we place the value. It's never, and the whole concept of price your worth, I think in our industry just needs to be smashed and, and gone. <laughs> it's just like side yeah. tangent. Yeah, it's, it's also super, it's also super loaded. Like what is that? Yeah. What does that mean, right? Like, you know. Was that an answer? This, is, this could be a whole other tangent, but I think, you know, as humans, we have to separate this idea that our worth has a price tag, right? So, you know, just because I, I have bills to pay and it costs money to live doesn't mean I'm worth a certain price for a haircut. Um, definitely that language totally could change. Yeah. I mean, you go to a restaurant and you order like a, a meal and that restaurateur will tell you exactly how it's priced based on like the napkin, this, the condiments, like everything is broken down to give you value and we should be the same. Totally. I totally agree with that. Um, and so the next question here, these are like simple questions, but they're kind of like <laughs> complicated to answer. I know. I know. They <laughs> always are. <laughs> So the next question is, what is the best way to deal with a difficult client? I I have so many stories. I used I was a salon manager for a much longer time than I was a a stylist on mm -hmm. a, by, by itself. So I'll let you share, and then and then you like <laughs> I you know when you have people like who want to speak to the manager like <laughs> yeah right. I mean, really, it's like it's, ah, yeah. There's so many things to talk about under this, but like what it comes down to too is like what what makes that client a difficult client is really, I think the root of it. And is it just, is it some, is it a, it, I mean, it's most often, and I'm going to say, because we've dealt a lot with this as a salon owner, as a manager, it's most often a communication breakdown is really what kind of sets the situation up um, often. And so it's really about having like clear and effective communication with your clients to avoid these situations. But there could also be some, some opportunities to create healthy boundaries around your service too, so that you don't create an opportunity where your clients expect too much more of you. You know, I mean, like I've had stylists say like, how do I get my clients to stop texting me at 11 o'clock at night? I'm like, stop answering, <laughs> right? Have business hours, right? So, you know, is this client a difficult client because they finally have overstepped a boundary that they didn't know existed. And so it made that relationship a little, a little challenging. So it's completely okay to have hours to operate and like healthy boundaries around your client relationships. You know, it, it's challenging because we have a relationship business, right? But um, you are also still a business. And so that's the important thing to start with. And boundaries don't have to be walls, like brick walls. Like I, I kind of tell my, my team, I'm like, it's not a brick wall, it's like a chain link fence. You know what I mean? Like it's like a boundary is just like a healthy barrier um, that sets communication up to be successful so that you're laying out the groundwork. So like you're telling someone how they do business with you and just like every other business does. And I think that that's a great way to kind of preempt creating a difficult situation because more often than not, it's about a communication breakdown. That's what starts it. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, to your point about like boundaries, I think it's very interesting to unpack this word difficult. And I think being a hairstylist is where I learned boundaries, but specifically the boundary that says what someone else's behavior is doesn't mean something about my, me. And 99% of the time, how someone is acting is not about me at all. Mm -hmm. And that helped me de-escalate so many conversations and really get to the root of what the client was trying to say. Cause that's the other thing too, is that, you know, if you think about it, like we as stylists have the expertise, like we're the perceived people that are gonna give them what they want and they potentially really couldn't do it on their own, right? Mm -hmm. And so it kind of is actually a relationship of hierarchy. So you're as stylist, mm -hmm. you're in a position of power and that person, if they're if they come in and they they've had terrible haircuts in the past, or they've never had a stylist who can get them to the right color that they want, you know, I've seen also on TikTok recently, like, oh, if, if this person says in the past that they've had like they've never had a great hairstylist, it's a red flag. And these are just things I just don't agree with. And I'll just use one example. I 
I'm a professional colorist. And so I will, when I see a client for the first time, we want to get on the same page, but what we think colors are like, believe it or not, human beings see color differently. And so I also want to understand that if we don't have the same way that we look at color, there's mm -hmm. only so far we can go in our relationship as colorist to client. Right. And so I would have, um, different Pinterest boards of like cool blonde and warm blonde and neutral blonde and so forth. They're like warm brunette, cool brunette, neutral. Like what is the language? What are we doing here? Mm -hmm. At one time I had this client, I, I kept giving her what she said that she wanted, but she would always call two days later telling me her color was looking ashy. And this happened like three or four times. And, and this is like, before I got to understand people see differently. Mm -hmm. I had a three or four times and I'm like, this, this woman, like, honestly, she had hundred percent gray. So I knew when I was formulating my color that I don't, I don't put ash usually in hundred percent gray formula unless that person wants ice blonde, right? And so I was like, what do you mean ash? Like I literally put warmth in your color. Like, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. um, and it just turned out. So she showed me what she wanted. She showed me what she thought she looked like. And what she thought she looked like was nothing that I was seeing. And so in that moment, that was the first time I said to a client, I was like, you know, I really enjoyed speaking to you and I've enjoyed getting to know you. And I think it would be best for us, you know, if we cut ties professionally, because my eye cannot see what your eye sees. And she thanked me for telling her that honestly, and she found the colorist for her who could really understand what she was seeing. And that was like the first time I really implemented that specific boundary of like, sis, we ain't seen eye to eye, like time to move on. Um, but yeah, that's like, you know, getting to the bottom of like, what does difficult mean? And like, isn't my job to like understand or to break down a difficult thing into something that's tangible and, and we can get to the bottom of it together, you know? Yeah, yeah. And also, I mean, we had an experience with a client who was having a lot of anxiety about all the COVID protocols of coming into a salon. And even just to kind of get her, it was almost like coaching her in the door. You know what I mean? And once we got her in, it was fine. But it was like, is that difficult or is that just anxiety and kind of understanding where your client is coming from? It's really a communication breakdown. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, for sure. And it could be, you know, if this person say and go back to this red flags thing, if this yeah. person has seen 10 stylists and no one has given her the service that she's wanted, like maybe no one educated her on the kind of language she can use with her stylist. Yeah. Or maybe um, nobody was trained in her hair specifically. Right. So maybe she actually has never had that experience before. So, yeah, for sure. For sure. I think mm -hmm. we can go down a super <laughs> rabbit hole with this question, but, but yeah, now I'm let's just going on that caramel. Like, how do you define caramel to a client? Like, that's the hardest Listen, color. I'm talking I, about caramel. It was like, <laughs> but it's just so interesting. And it's like, you know, people are like, well, I want warmth, but no red. And I'm like, no whoa, like, what does yeah. that mean? That's anyway. Like, but assuming that your clients, you know, always know that your clients don't know the language of a hairstylist. Yeah. So provide as much information as you possibly can. And it helps a lot. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And even asking where they're getting this word from, too. Because it might be like mm -hmm. a buzzword they picked up or like someone in the street told them a certain thing about hair, but they didn't really have an understanding. So it's like, well, what does language mean? And like, how can we get on the same page? And then an educational way, because it's also very easy to be condescending when that kind of thing comes up. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So yeah, it's super nuanced, I think. I agree. Shall we move on? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so here's a really great question. So this question is asking, how should I book for the year? Some stylists open only open books for four weeks. Some open every quarter. I have mine open for the whole year and I feel overwhelmed. You know, I can't even imagine doing this because what if you just want to go on a vacation and you can't because you're booked out for like the next six months? That's too much. I, you know what? Same. And like I fall, I fell into this exact routine. When I opened up my first salon, I, I left and I opened up like a suite and I had online booking and I had a client call me and it was like three months after I'd opened up the salon, I had a client call me. She's like, I can't find an appointment in your schedule at all this year. I was like, what? Excuse me, ma'am, what? <laughs> so I went on to my book and realized that I was booked out for the year. And it was like <gasps> panic because I didn't want to, I didn't want to move people. I didn't want to do anything. And so I had years of like missing 
missing wedding ceremonies because I was already booked that Saturday and then only going to the reception and missing the whole, you know what I mean? Or missing all these events, family events, and vacations and weekend trips. And like, I'm down to only being able to book a trip on a Sunday and Monday and that's it. So it's like, it's a lot. It's a, it's too much and you can definitely get o- overwhelmed. I think that there's a benefit to, to maybe all of it. It, it really depends on your own, I mean, your own ability to handle the situation, like your own, like if you're cool with booking out the whole year and then just calling your clients and being like, I'm taking off for the week and moving them, then do it. That's totally fine. But I think that really opening up your books for a set amount of time and give yourself that ability is the best way to create healthy boundaries. So whether that's like every four weeks or the quarter, that's totally up to you. But if you're feeling overwhelmed, close your schedule for sure close it and then announce it. You just announce it on Instagram. Like I'm opening up my books this day at this time and then let people go online and do their own thing and book their appointment. And, you know, make sure that when you're opening up that time frame, you're taking the time that you need for yourself to recharge too, right? Like it's book your time off ahead of time within that window and know what you need. So whether that's, like I said, a quarter or a month out, like I think that that's really important. I know that we're going to be opening up our books only um, one month at a time um, here in the salon. And I think that that's important. The idea of pre-booking anymore, like I don't think we have to be so worried about pre-booking appointments because with online booking and everything, your clients are booking your appointments at like, I don't know, midnight when they remember. You know what I mean? Like no, what, not when your salon is open, but when they're they're doing it at their own convenience. So I don't think you have to be so worried about like pre-booking measurements anymore. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's It's not as important as it used to be. Totally. Unless maybe I can imagine doing a hybrid, for example, for me, and this is totally not hair, but when I used to get my nails done every three weeks, I would book out my appointments like six months in advance because I would die if I couldn't see my girl when, when I, when I needed to see her. Mm -hmm. Um, But she would like shut herself down for the holidays too, because people would just take up all her time. I also like, I wonder too, if it depends on your mindset, because I get very stressed out when I see myself booked out for too long so that I just feel like I'm trapped and I can't go anywhere. But that's just mm-hmm. like, and I'm sure there's some people who like need that comfort. Like, oh, this is like my schedule. This is what my time looks like and so forth. Do you think oh, like personality? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And like, oh, totally personality. And like, you know, looking, being able to look forward in your book and say, this is my guaranteed income for that month mm-hmm. is really is a lot is comforting for a lot of people. So it really, it really does depend on your personality. And I know that like for me, when we're moving over, I'll, I'll go back and forth based on my own anxiety. Like that's, and that's honestly the truth is like, sometimes I totally freak out and I'm like, Oh my God, nobody's in my schedule. And it's because it's not open, but then I freak out and I open it up. And then I'm like, there's too many people in my schedule. (laughs) I go back and forth, which is not a good place to be. (laughs) But so it but, sounds like typical stylist, like even on a day, like no. I would go into the salon and look at my day and be like, oh, like I have too many gaps. And then all my gaps are filled. I'm like, I have no time. Okay. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. Like, what do we do? I think, I guess maybe the point is you have to just be fluid with what works best for you and your own mindset, your own personality. Cause that's, yeah. I know my whole team laughs every time. I'm just like, nobody's booking with me. I don't know what to do. And they're like, you closed your schedule. All right, calm down sis, calm down. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh, so funny. Okay, so we have one more question here. And the question is how do I avoid over purchasing supplies? And I think this could actually go for all overhead, like Mm. especially when you're in a smaller salon and you don't even have like storage room. Like how do you know, anyway, how do you avoid over purchasing? Okay, so I love it because we don't have a lot of storage. We're like this big open space. And like, I have one little closet for storage when to hide stuff like paper towels and toilet paper and all the stuff that you just don't want out. Um, I love the, um, the like Amazon auto ship every like month or two months. So I just know what's going to happen. I know exactly what I'm getting. And it's a good way to budget those, those specific things, laundry detergent and paper towels and that kind of stuff and know when you're going to get it all the time so that you only have what you need for that moment. That's a great way of doing it. But for me, it's also about setting a budget ahead 
of the of the month like not not tracking after you've spent it but deciding your budget categories before you spend it that's really important and like really evaluating what's needed and what's necessary and i know that color is like a hard one to kind of have because it depends on your month to month needs and that kind of stuff but you could avoid over purchasing color by writing down how much you mix and so that you know that you you have exactly what you need every time. So on our formula card, I always write down our formula, but then I'll write down how much I use in that specific moment, um, like my measurement. So I'm not freehanding. Like I definitely, definitely recommend scales so that you're measuring all the same time. So you're not overusing or wasting product because then you're just, that's usually where the biggest, um, let's say like hole in the, in the pool, when it's all where all the water leaks out. <laughs> it's like, yeah is color supplies and color purchasing because there's so much color waste. Um, we're, a, we're a, I'm a green circle salon. There's an, a company called green circle and they actually allow you to recycle your color waste, which is really great. They dehydrate it and they treat the water and they put it back into the water system. And then they take the the powder form of the color um, once it's dehydrated and use it for like sustainable fuel. So you can pack up and save your color and ship it off. So it's a really great way of seeing how much, waste actually is created from that. Um, and it gets you really aware of when to, how to cut back on that waste. So that's always some tricks that we use. Yeah, super smart. Yeah, I feel like where I've seen the most over purchasing is definitely color. Um, and I think it's really hard, especially if you're in a larger salon and if people also don't understand, like if your staff doesn't understand what does it mean to not over mix? What does it mean to formulate correctly? Like these are, th I've seen colorists get let go from salons from wasting color. Um, so I think it's something really to take a look at, come up with some kind of system. Like how do I, is there an, maybe, I don't know. I've never heard of this. I'm thinking of off the top of my head, but maybe there's some kind of incentive for a colorist to be more sustainable with their color. Mm -hmm. There was actually, I remember a long time ago where was, um, there was like a, like kind of a business class and they were talking about doing this kind of challenge almost, right? Where you um, had every stylist measure the color they were using and then measure the waste, like when it was done. So come back and remeasure the bowl afterwards and then track it. And whoever had the least amount of color waste, like won something at the end. So there's like, there could be fun ways of tracking that. Just, I think it's really about keeping, especially in a salon setting, because that's a whole other conversation, right? Like when you're one-on-one, -on -one, if you're in, in, if you're in a suite and it's your color waste, I think you're so much more aware of it because it's your money. It's, you can see it go, but when it's a salon purchasing it for you, it's harder to track. Cause it's like, whatever, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, kind of a little bit. Yeah. Basically, if it doesn't personally hurt your wallet, it's a little bit hard to be aware right. of what you're doing. Exactly. So like as a salon owner, it is like you said, the, you said the magic word, Faith. It's, sim it's systems. It's really important to find a system that works for you, whether that's remeasuring the waste or that's having your clients write down or your, your um, stylist write down how much they need for that. Um, having a system in place that keeps that going that, and that having that system be consistent is really mm -hmm. important so that it becomes second nature. It's about consistency always. Yeah. Yeah, I, one thing I'll also say, like, again, maybe this is for larger salons, but, you know, having some sort of salon software that helps you keep an inventory and some kind of simple, quick way to keep track of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you know, if you every time a colorist uses a color tube, somehow scanning that color tube out and then, you know, by the end of the month, you can see your color consumption and it better. It, it should technically match up with the, the clientele you have. So if you have an uptick in color services, you'll probably see an uptick in color usage. If you don't, then you can actually look, start looking at your colorists. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, like you shared, like have a system. Don't try to keep things in notebooks, especially this kind of thing. Like technology, so technology is our friend. Technology is mm -hmm. our friend. So yeah, and there's also many different consultants and even stylist friends who are willing to help if you find yourself being tech not so tech savvy um but it's worth it it's like the such a headache if you don't have that one of my favorite um tools to use for this also is a company called salon scale um i don't know if you've heard of them but they have bluetooth scales that actually connect to 
um, like a, an iPad or a phone, and it will have all of your color information and they'll come preloaded. So you tell them what color line you use and it'll have all your costs on it completely and it tracks all of your inventory and all of your costs. So even when you're billing out, you're able to separate parts of labor. So you can make sure that the amount of product that you've used for that specific service is included in the billing of the actual service. It's a really great, um, wow. yeah, so it's called Salon Scale but it's a really great company and it's really, really easy to use. That's genius. Definitely never heard of that, but look at that. Technology is definitely our friend. Yeah, technology is amazing now. <laughs> years ago, <laughs> so much easier. Wow. So yeah, that's actually it for our questions for today. Um, I went ahead and put up how you can send, continue to send us questions. You can go ahead and direct message us on Instagram, our handle is Diva Curl Pro. And we will be coming back on Wednesday with more questions to ask our friend Dom. He's a kingdom of curls on Instagram. You probably know him. If not, you should get to know him. But we'll have him on our show Wednesday at 7 p.m. And we'll be asking him some stylist questions as well, more specifically related to um, things like protective styling and such. So. Get your questions sent in and we'll be excited to hear from y'all. Amazing. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye.